Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The year of mercy ends today, so we'll close it with a very short reflection by St. Alphonsus, and I quote, God is merciful, but he's also just, and therefore he's obliged to punish those who offend him. He shows mercy, but to whom? To them who fear him. Now, parenthetical remark, when we're talking about the fear of the Lord, there are two kinds of fear possible. There's servile fear and there's filial fear. Servile fear is the fear of a slave. This is a fear of somebody, it's good for a conversion, because this is a fear of somebody that's, uh, that's uh, really in a, living a bad life, and so it motivates them to convert because they don't want to wind up where they're heading. Filial fear is the fear of someone living a good life. It's the fear of a son who's afraid of disappointing a father whom he knows loves him so much. So those are the two kinds of fear, Lord, and they're, and they're, both, they're both useful. Anyway, so St. Alphonsus, God is merciful, but he's also just. And therefore, he's obliged to punish those who offend him. He shows mercy, but to whom? To them that fear him. As Psalm 102 states, he has strengthened his mercy towards them that fear him. As the Father has compassion on his children, so hath the Lord compassion on them that fear him. Close quote. But he executes justice on those who despise him and who abuse his mercy to insult him the more. Close quote. So God has mercy on those who fear him, but he executes his justice on those who despise him and abuse his mercy to insult him the more. As our Lord told St. Faustina, quote, He who refuses to pass the door of my mercy must pass the door of my justice. Close quote. So the year of mercy ends today, and given the state of the world, since he has mercy on them that fear him, but he executes justice on those that despise him and abuse his mercy, uh, we should all prepare as a people to enter into God's justice. You should prepare yourself. Now to the sermon. As usual, the, the quotes have been edited, cut and pasted, and some of what we're going to cover today I've, I've spoken of elsewhere. So we've come to the end of the liturgical year, and for the next two weeks, the church asks us to consider the end of the world, and so we'll do just that. And the powers of heaven shall be moved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Everybody knows that the sun, the moon, and the stars separate the day from the night and used to mark out our days and our years and our seasons. But how many of us have stopped to consider that God has also deliberately set them up there for signs? In Genesis 1.14, we read, quote, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Close quote, inspired and errant word of God. Now, obviously, we're all familiar with the star of Bethlehem as a sign of our Lord's birth. And we're all familiar with the miraculous eclipse of the sun, which happened during a full moon. That's impossible during our Lord's crucifixion and on Good Friday. And that was a sign that the creator of the world was hanging on the cross. But given today's gospel, we're going to spend some time talking about signs of judgment in the heavens, because that's what's in the gospel. Now, before we get to that, let's put the gospel into context. Just before today's passage, our Lord and the apostles are standing on Mount Olivet, and they're looking down at the temple. And the apostles ask our Lord two questions. One question about the destruction of the temple, and one question about the end of the world. And then our Lord responds by answering both questions at the same time. So when he says that that generation would not pass till all those things be, be come to pass, uh, all those things be done, he's referring to the destruction of the temple, which did come to pass in AD 70 in that very generation. But there's more to it than that. Remember what we learned two weeks ago. Remember that a type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists but it's intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action, okay? Now, the temple is a type of the church, and the city of Jerusalem, a type of the world. So the siege of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in AD 70 are types of the end of the world, which means that even when our Lord is talking specifically about the siege of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, he's also, at the very same time, Speaking about the end of the world, but in a type, in a foreshadowing, is a preview of upcoming events, okay? So that's the context. Let's get started. In both scripture and tradition, signs of judgment in the heavens portend God's wrath falling on people. The prophetic signs that foreshadow and the overthrow and destruction of kingdoms, 
nations and peoples, and even the world. For example, Isaiah chapter 13 uses terms like what we heard in today's gospel. I quote from the prophet Isaiah. The day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger. For the stars of the heavens and the constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rise and the moon will not shed its light. I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place. Close quote. Now all that is referring to the upcoming destruction of Babylon, which took place in 539 B.C. But it's also a type of the end of the world. So it can stand for more than one thing. Consider some of the heavenly signs and portents sent by God before the fall and destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, which were recorded by an eyewitness, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, I quote from his work. The people did not attend nor give credit to the signs which were so evident and did so plainly foretell their future destruction. But like men without eyes to see or minds to consider, they did not regard the denunciations that God made to them. Thus there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year. Close quote. There's lots of others. If you read the roar of the Jews, there's lots of other signs, but we're just uh, going to touch on those. The people did not pay attention to the signs that were so evident and so plainly foretold their future destruction, but like men without eyes to see or minds to think, paid no attention to the warnings that God gave them. Okay. So one of the reasons that God has set out the sun, the moon, and the stars up there is to be used as signs of his upcoming judgments. With that in mind, let's turn to today's gospel. St. Alphonsus summarizes the teaching of the fathers regarding a line which we find in the gospel. And the powers of heaven shall be moved. I quote from St. Alphonsus. Another sign of the end of the world will be, and the powers of heaven shall be moved. Some understand this to mean tremors and unusual movements which will occur in the heavens. That is, the firmness of the heavens will seem to be lacking as they will tremble before the Lord comes to judge the world. Close quote. End quote. The coming of the judge will be preceded by fire. Fire will descend from heaven, shall burn the earth and all things upon the earth. The earth, defiled by sin, must be purified by fire. Close quote, St. Alphonsus Liguori, Doctor of the Church. Tremors and unusual movements in the heavens. The firmness of the heavens will seem to be lacking as they will tremble. Fire will descend from heaven. Now, I don't know what that sounds like to you, but I'll tell you what it sounds like to me. It sounds exactly like the miracle of the sun. With that in mind, let's briefly consider the events in Fatima on October 13th, 1917. At the time, Portugal was ruled by the Freemasons. It was so bad that Lisbon had been proclaimed to be the atheistic capital of the world. The prevailing attitude of the Portuguese press and elites was an atheistic, extremely hostile, mocking disbelief in anything that had anything to do with Catholicism. In many ways, it's very similar to our own situation today. For three months, since July 13th, three small children who could neither read nor write, Lucia dos Santos, she's 10 years old, and her two cousins, Francisco Marto, who's nine years old, and Jacinta Marto, seven years old, had been predicting that Our Lady would perform a great miracle on October 13th. A miracle had been publicly announced three months in advance as to the precise date, time, and place. There is literally nothing like this in the entire history of the world. This is literally, literally an absolutely unparalleled historical event. The precise date, time, and place of a public miracle had been announced three months in advance by illiterate peasant children from a tiny village in the hills of Portugal. Now we'll cut and splice quotes of eyewitnesses to get some sense of what happened. Although the rain had been steadily pelting down all morning, it suddenly stopped, and just as suddenly, the sky cleared. This abrupt change of weather surprised all of the 70,000 witnesses. Men, women, and children from every social class and cultural level, believers and unbelievers alike, who were standing there in that muddy sheep pasture. It was a day of continuous and heavy rain. But a few minutes before the miracle, it stopped raining. Suddenly all the clouds disappeared without the slightest breeze, and the sun was shining in a clear sky. There were also changes of color in the atmosphere. I looked first at the nearest objects, and then extended my glass farther afield as far as the horizon. I saw that everything had assumed an amethyst color. 
Objects around me, the sky and atmosphere were of the same color. An oak tree nearby cast a shadow of this color on the ground. Soon I heard a peasant who was near me shout out in tones of amazement, Look, that lady is all yellow. In fact, everything both near and far had changed. My own hand was the same color. Close quote. So the miracle starts with the rain suddenly stopping, and the sky clearing, and then the sunlight goes to the different colors of the rainbow. For the description of what happened next, we'll turn to an account taken from the Freemasonic Daily Paper of Lisbon. This account was written by a man who cannot possibly be accused of being a favorable witness. He's the chief editor. Quote, and then we witnessed a unique spectacle, an incredible spectacle, unbelievable if you did not witness it. We saw the huge crowd turn towards the sun, which appeared at its zenith, clear the clouds. It resembled a disk of silver and it was possible to stare at it without the least discomfort. It did not burn the eyes. It did not blind. Then a tremendous cry rang out, and the crowd nearest us were heard to shout, Miracle, miracle, marvel, marvel. The attitude of the people takes us back to biblical times. Dumbfounded, with heads uncovered, they contemplated the blue sky. Before their dazzled eyes, the sun trembled. It made strange and abrupt movements outside of all cosmic laws, and according to the typical expression of the peasants, the sun danced. Close quote. By the way, if you study the photographs, and those photographs are actually from the Freemasonic newspaper, everyone's staring at the sun and almost no one is shading their eyes. It's a remarkable testimony in itself that you can see all these people looking face on at the sun. The most terrifying aspect of the miracle took place immediately after the dance of the sun. The sun suddenly seemed to plunge towards earth. Quote, then suddenly one heard a clamor, a cry of anguish breaking from all the people. The sun, whirling wildly, seemed all at once to loosen itself from the firmament, and blood red plunged towards the earth, threatening to crush us with its huge and fiery weight. The sensation of those moments was truly terrible. It seemed like a wheel of fire which was going to fall on the people. Close quotes. Quote, Everyone within an area of 32 miles thought it was the end of the world. One witness, he was later a contractor in California, was about 11 miles away from Fatim. He was 12 years old, and he was herding sheep. He said, I don't remember to this day what happened to the sheep. All I can remember is that this fireball came down upon the earth, and I knew I was about to be burnt alive. And I ran, and I ran, and I ran. All I can remember is my fear. And I've often waked up at night running from the fire. We thought it was the end of the world. The fire of the sun was on top of us. All at the time the fire was coming on, their shouts, parents were throwing themselves, protecting all over their children. People were shouting their sins out loud and confessing and crying for mercy. They fell to their knees in the mud and water, confessed their sins and called for mercy. And what happened? The fire went back into the sky. Close quotes. Now, those are all quotes from eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses who thought they were about to be burnt to death with fire falling from the heavens. Terrified parents instinctively throwing themselves over their children to protect them. People screaming out their sins and crying for mercy. Eyewitnesses who thought it was the end of the world. And all those people who were for the most part soaked to the bone were amazed to discover they were dry and so was the ground. Quote, the nor- this enormous multitude was drenched for it rained unceasingly since dawn. But though this may appear incredible, after the great miracle, everyone felt comfortable and found his garments quite dry, a subject of general wonder. My suit dried in an instant. The moment one would least expect it, our clothes were totally dry. Close quotes. At least 70,000 witnesses braving the rain and mud. When suddenly the sky clears, the sun shoots out the colors of the rainbow, it whirls and spins and dances, but then breaks free and hurtles towards earth. People convinced they're about to be burnt alive, fall to their knees in the mud and the water, confess their sins, cry out for mercy, and then the sun retreats, leaving everyone in dry clothes on dry ground. At least 70,000 witnesses, and many of them not believers, that went there to mock the Catholics. The miracle of the sun and the prophecy of the miracle three months in advance are verifiable historical facts. It's obvious that both the precise fulfillment of this prophecy as to the date, time, and place of the miracle, as well as the events of the miracle itself, can only be explained as direct acts of God himself. This is not a private revelation. 
This is not the words of Our Lady. This is a historical event. Let's make sure we have some idea of how amazing this reality is by pausing there for a minute to put it into its larger historical context. If we stand back a little and consider the entire history of the world, to put the miracle of the sun in context, we see we have five roughly comparable events, five similar miracles of absolutely incredible magnitude. There's the parting of the Red Sea by Moses. There's the stopping of the sun and the moon in the sky by Joshua. There's the moving of the sun backwards in the sky, ten full hours by the prophet Isaiah. There's the total eclipse of the sun during a full moon, complete impossibility, which took place at the crucifixion of our Lord. And there's the miracle of the sun. In the entire history of the world, there are five of these miracles. Four of those miracles are found in the Holy Bible. Three in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. And out of all those miracles, the only one that was predicted beforehand, three months beforehand, happened in our own time. We still have some very old people that were alive when this happened. That's Fatima. It's completely incredible. In the entire history of the world, the miracle of the sun is an absolutely unique and unparalleled event. You should let that sink in. That means something. We're being told something very, very important here. Why did God perform that miracle? Why did God perform that miracle, that exact miracle? Obviously, it confirms the truth that Our Lady is appearing and has a message. Obviously, it's an unmistakable confirmation that Our Lady had been speaking to the children. It's an unmistakable confirmation that Our Lady had indeed delivered a message to the children. God never acts without a purpose. And so the miracle of His Son, an absolutely un unparalleled, unique historical event, a miracle of unprecedented proportions, a miracle of literally biblical proportions, is a sign pointing towards corresponding message of unprecedented importance, a message of biblical importance. But that's a topic for another day. Today we're just simply considering the miracle in itself. We're not concerning ourselves at all with the message. The miracle points to the message, but the miracle itself wasn't a random event. God never acts without a purpose. The miracle itself has a meaning. It is meant to tell us something. And we're being told something very, very important. What does the miracle mean in itself? Well, in this case, the apocalyptic overtones are obvious. That's not reading a meaning of the miracle after the fact, as we just heard. The witnesses themselves were convinced of this. The year, nearly unanimous reaction of the witnesses was that they were seeing the end of the world. You see, apocalyptic image in this miracle is also consistent with the tradition of the church, as we saw earlier when considered the remarks made by St. Alphonsus. People are concerned with the message of Our Lady to the children. They should be, but the miracle itself means something. Because God never acts without a purpose. So what does it mean in itself? We'll use the scriptures as a basis for reflection to quickly consider two aspects of this miracle, basing ourselves on a passage from the second chapter of Second Peter, starting at verse 5. Slightly abridged. Quote, God spared not the original world, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and reducing the city of the Sodomites and the Gomorites into ashes, and delivered just to the lot, oppressed by the injustice and lewd conversation of the wicked. So that's the inspired word of God. In this scripture, St. Peter speaks of God's judgment at the time of Noah and the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. What does any of that have to do with the miracle of the sun? We'll answer that by considering two aspects of the miracle, as signs or portents of judgment in the heavens. The first aspect, the parting of the clouds and the sun shooting out all the colors of the rainbow. My personal opinion is that the downpour which suddenly ceased followed immediately by the clearing of the sky and the sun shooting out the various colors, all that's meant to remind us of the great flood and the rainbow. The rainbow is a visible reminder on the one hand that even if we don't understand, as long as we're faithful and obedient like Noah and his family, then even if the whole world be swallowed up in a flood, God is merciful and he'll take care of us. So that's on the one hand. Now on the other hand, the rainbow is also a sign of what happens to men if they're evil and faithless and disobey God. 
It's a visible sign that God will never destroy the world again with water. And so this aspect of the miracle is meant to remind us of God's judgment. But as St. Peter said, he spared not the original world when he brought in the flood and the world of the ungodly. And as we've seen, signs in the heavens are portents of the overthrown destruction of governments in society, of the looming judgments of God being rendered at a political level, since nations have to be judged in this life. In that regard, I'm also of the opinion, and that's all it is, that the various colors point forward to the so-called so color revolutions in our own time, like the Rose Revolution in the Republic of Georgia, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Pink Revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the Blue Revolution in Kuwait, all these orchestrated regime change operations, which for the past several decades have been destabilizing and toppling governments. It always, they always follow the same basic pattern. Activists that are typically funded and trained by so-called NGOs, these non-governmental organizations, stir up protests and civil unrest, question the legitimacy of an election, and accuse the leader of some type of authoritarianism. The goal is to, quote, debilitate and disorganize the pillars of state power, neutralize security forces, and create a sensation of chaos and instability, close quote. And it works, it works. Since the election, we've been seeing what has already been dubbed the Purple Revolution here in our own country, with riots in at least 10 major cities. These riots may only be the beginning of sorrows. If they can't intimidate the Electoral College, we may really get a taste of our own medicine uh, around inauguration time. Anyway, so we've considered the parting of clouds and sun suiting out all the colors of the rainbow as signs or portents of judgment in heaven. Now let's consider the second aspect, which is the falling of the sun. The falling of the sun is meant to remind us of the fire from the sky that, as St. Peter said, reduced the cities of the Sodomites and the Gomorites into ashes. At the same time, it's also meant to remind us of the fire from the sky that both scripture and tradition tell us will destroy the world before our Lord comes to judge the living and the dead. So this aspect of the miracle is also meant to remind us of the judgments of God. And as we've seen, the witnesses themselves were convinced that when the sun was falling, they were seeing the end of the world. So the rain and the rainbow symbolize the punishment of the flood at Noah's time, and the falling of the sun symbolized the fire from the sky that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we saw just a few weeks ago, both the judgment on the whole world during the time of Noah and the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah are intimately related. We read something to that effect from the Jewish commentaries known as the Midrash, these eight commentaries. We heard this two weeks ago. Again, I've edited it for the sake of the young, but just as a reminder, these ancient commentaries state, quote, the generation of the flood was not wiped out until they wrote marriage documents for perverse marriages. In other words, the sins which provoked the Great Flood were the same sins which Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire and brimstone from heaven, and are the same sins which we have going on all around us today, not only approved and promoted and protected by our federal government, but by many other governments throughout the world. Isn't it interesting? The Sodomites have chosen the rainbow as the symbol for their movement. And given the association of purple with the sodomite movement, isn't it interesting that activists have apparently chosen it as the color of what appears to be a revolution here in America? Noah preached for a hundred years before the great flood struck. And as we know, almost no one paid any attention to his warning. The miracle of the sun is very, very clear warning from Our Lady about upcoming events, a wake-up call for all those with eyes to see. But as it was in the days of Noah, so it is in our days. Very few seem to take her warning seriously either. As we close in on 100th anniversary of the miracle of the sun, we should ask ourselves if anyone's paid any attention to Our Lady's warning. Are we paying any attention to the signs that are so evident and so plain? Are we like men without eyes to see or minds to think? Are we paying any attention to the warnings that God has given us? Has anyone paid any attention to Our Lady's warning? Because she just gave another warning only six months ago. She just gave another warning. On May 4th, in the Portuguese town of Orem, that's seven miles away from the COVID area. The COVID area is the very site where Our Lady of Fatima appeared in 1917. On May 4th of this year, Our Lady gave another warning. As a secular Portuguese newspaper, Correio de Manha, reported on May 5th, quote, yesterday, more than 100 faithful experienced the phenomenon in Orem, which they describe as a new miracle of the sun. Close quote. I asked a friend of mine whose first language is Portuguese to give me a summary of what the witnesses reported on Portuguese TV. The videos are already available online if you can understand Portuguese. For the first time in 50 years, the pilgrim statue of Our Lady of Fatima visited Orem. It had been venerated throughout the night in the church. 
At about 8 a.m., as soon as they processed out of the church with Our Lady, the miracle began, and it lasted about 15 minutes. The priest did not see anything unusual, but this was seen by about 100 of the people in the procession, who all described the same phenomenon. They could look at the sun, and the outer rim of the sun was spinning, and it was red. Then it turned golden, as if it were made of gold. Then it turned blue. The whole time it was spinning at high speed. The sun itself was also blinking. One interviewer noted that 100 witnesses saw what some are calling a miracle, and that all their accounts are the same. An interview asked, was it a miracle? One witness said, yes, it was a miracle. And her ladies tried to say something to us. It was a miracle and our ladies tried to say something. So what is she saying? A little background will get a better grasp on what she's saying. On August 13th, 1917, the three children were kidnapped by the Freemasonic mayor of Orem. He jailed them there and spent two days trying to pry the secret out of them and get them to admit they were lying, going so far as to even threaten to martyr them by boiling them alive in oil. But through it all, the children remained steadfast. Meanwhile, seven miles away, over at the COVID area, there were some 15 to 18,000 people awaiting Our Lady's arrival. And even though the children were being held prisoner up at a rim, Our Lady still came to the COVID. One witness has described some of the events, quote, The clap of thunder was followed by lightning, and at once we began to notice a small cloud, very pretty, white in color, very light, which hovered some moments over the homo, then rose towards the sky and disappeared in the atmosphere. The face of the people had all the colors of the rainbow, pink, red, blue. The ground was covered with squares of different colors. Clothes were also the, every color of the rainbow. The trees did not appear to have branches and leaves, but only flowers. Everything seemed laden with flowers, and every leaf appeared to be a flower. Close quote. Now, obviously, Our Lady knew the children weren't there. But Our Lady does things on her own terms. Although she knew full well the children weren't in a rim, she came to the cove as she'd said. Then on August 19th, she unexpectedly appeared to the children near their homes at a place called Valinos. Notice this exact, the exact opposite of that Magigori thing, where, where the, it, basically you could have a rock and roll t-shirt, Our Lady on tour, whatever the devil is that's appearing on, with, with the, it's a seance, it's not, it's not Our Lady, Our Lady does not appear on demand. So in 1917, even though the children had been taken there, Our Lady did not appear in a room. But now almost 100 years later, on May 4th, just six months ago, Our Lady finally graces the rim with her presence and she does a miracle there. She does things on her own terms. Even though for the most part her message has been ignored and forgotten, even though for the most part her requests have not been fulfilled by the bishops, priests, and the faithful, even though the consecration is still waiting in its fullness, she will still triumph and conquer evil. Now with all that as background, let's ask ourselves what it means. The date is significant. May 4th is the day on which the Fatima Novena begins. The symbolism is obvious. The days are numbered. It's the 99th year. Again, the symbolism is obvious. The time is short. Time's running out. We must stay close to our lady. The symbolism of the colors is fairly obvious. Red symbolizes martyrdom. Gold symbolizes God's presence. The blue symbolizes our lady. The color red is a sign of martyrdom. It's obviously related also to the location, since the rem is the precise place where the three little children were put to the test, even unto death, to the point where they actually believed that the others had been martyred by being boiled alive in oil. And yet they each remained faithful. There are trials ahead. But even should we threaten with martyrdom, we must remain firm in the faith by remaining close to and obedient to Our Lady, obedient even unto death. We must be prepared, fully prepared, to live and die for the truth. The symbolism of following Our Lady is also obvious. We must faithfully follow Our Lady, stay very close to her, just like the children and the Apostle John, and she'll conquer. The symbolism of this miracle not being visible to the priest is also fairly obvious. Where was the parish priest during the children's trials? Miles away. Was he supporting them? No. The miracle of the sun should be in every single history book written since October 1917. Everyone in the world, not just the Catholics, should be familiar with all these details. And yet, how many priests even pay attention to these details? We must pray for the priests and prelates, but stay faithful. Trust Our Lady. Even when so many priests don't. Stay close to Our Lady, consecrate ourselves to Our Lady, and trust her just like the children of the Apostle John. Okay. If you mention these things about the miracle, for the most part, it's meant with jokes, mockery, and the like. We're living in a time when there's many false prophets and endine prophecies, those mind calendar thing or that craziness about the year 2000, in a time which people are, are saying the end is coming, then it comes and goes, and it's not the end. This atmosphere is 
created sort of immunity towards actually obeying our Lord's explicit command to read the signs of the times. Immunity to believe, immunity against believing this is ever something we should even concern ourselves with. Almost every time I discuss these things with priests, the response is a super patronizing answer along the lines of, people have always thought they're living in the end of the world. And you know, they're saying it like they're patting you on the head. And it said like, there's nothing more to talk about. That's just the end of the discussion. And even entertain further thought on the question is stupid. We just continue doing what we're doing, living like we're living, because all these prophetic end times come and go and there's no end. The terrifying result of this sort of atmosphere is that when real danger and real prophet arrives, like Our Lady of Fatima, people laugh and scorn and mock her and pay her no heed. They tell themselves it's all just a private relation, we don't have to believe it, they can't even bother to trouble themselves to consider the meaning of the miracle, which is not a revelation at all. It's a historical event. Once we see all this, we can see why those terrible things predicted for the end uh, will arrive, why so many people will be caught off guard. We can see why these things, they'll come like a thief in the night, because so many people have been conditioned by the lies of false prophets, by the laxity of the priests, by the atmosphere of society to think there is no danger of our Lord coming. Are we paying attention to signs that are so evident, so plain? Are we like men without eyes to see or minds to think? Are we paying any attention to the warning God has given us? Noah preached for a hundred years before the great flood struck. And as we know, almost no one paid any attention to his warning. This latest miracle of the sun is a very, very clear warning from Our Lady about upcoming events. A wake-up call for all those with eyes to see. But as it was in the days of Noah, so it is in our days. Our Lord specifically said, He specifically states the conditions at the end of the world would mirror both the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's close with a reflection on those days. As we've seen, Noah and his family lived in times similar to our day. They always strove to cling to the truth and had a great love for God. For years, they tried to share that truth and love with others. But for various reasons, others wouldn't let that truth and charity enter their hearts. Like today, many, many people are living very sinful lifestyles. But certainly then as now, there are many people living a very mild life where they didn't seem like bad people. Their good neighbors didn't seem so far off. Their hearts were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. They're doing just enough to look good and ease their conscience and yet still fit in. So they could avoid being thought of as extreme, avoid becoming outcasts in the crazy world they were living in, pretty much like our day and age. Under God's orders, God, Noah preached repentance and built an ark. The whole time, the majority mocked him, the rest ignored him, and only a few remained friendly and kind to his face. But that was about it. They didn't embrace his preaching with, his, with their hearts. At best, they gave him a superficial hearing, a superficial agreement with his preaching, but they didn't embrace it with all their hearts. They weren't willing to embrace a truth that was so painful, a truth that was such a heavy cross, a truth that didn't feel good, a truth that didn't make them look good in their neighbor's eyes. A truth that to embrace would instantly result in mockery and contempt. Even though many of them recognized at some level what Noah was saying was true, still it was just too costly, too painful to let themselves believe that God really meant what he said, that judgment was coming, that judgment was upon them. Yeah, it's bad, they tell themselves, but it's not that bad. Look at everybody else. I'm not that bad compared to them. There's safety in numbers. God knows we're weak. God has a sense of humor. And they push it out of their minds. They won't let them think about it. The Word of God was just too demanding. The Word of God was just too painful, too costly to fully embrace. And they'd lull their conscience to sleep with these soothing lies. Finally, the day arrives. People watch Noah and his family board the ark. They watch the miraculous gathering of the animals load on board. And then God himself closes and seals that huge door. And then the rain starts. It's really raining. Now people are starting to get scared. The more it rains, the scared they get. They start knocking on the ark, pawing on the ark, let me in, let me in, let me in. But it's too late. It's too late. For the past hundred years, they rejected God's word. They rejected God's warning. God sent them a prophet. God sent them warning after warning, a full century of warnings, but they didn't listen. They didn't pay attention. They didn't place their faith in God. They placed their hope in themselves. Now the only reason they want on board is because they fear for their lives. Not because they're full of charity. They have no charity. They're not getting on board. They had their chance. Now it's too late. 
Now comes the worst part. Just to p- picture the immense amount of grace no one his family must have been given to endure what happened next. The rain came, and their neighbors, their friends, their other family members, uncles, cousins, aunts, other relatives, came and knocked on our, pounded on our, begging for the door to be open. But God had closed the door. It had to remain closed. And those family trusted and obeyed God. As his justice fell, God gave him immense grace to endure the screaming, the terror, the children desperate and crying, wailing for help. The mothers holding their babies up, begging them to at least take the babies and save them from his death. The desperation of those voices at once mocked them, not crying to them for help. But God closed the door and had to remain closed. The cold, dreary, depressing days and nights with all this horrific wailing and crying till finally the last cries drown out, leaving an eerly silence as the last person can no longer stay afloat and slip into the flooding waters that cleanse the earth of sin. What great sorrow pierced the hearts of all those on the ark as they listened to the silence, the overwhelming sorrow that could have so easily been joy. If only those poor souls would embrace the virtues of faith, hope, and charity when there was still time. A great star, in spite of the consolation of realizing that some of those poor people had repented before drowning. What great thanksgiving Noah's family must have given to God for saving them in the midst of such an evil world, for giving them such a profound trust in God's mercy and justice. How unbelievably difficult this would have been. How much grace this would have taken to clearly recognize that God's justice is just. And not try to let anybody else into the ark, not even a baby. How much grace it would have taken if not fallen the temptation to play God and think they knew better. What a drive that should give each one of us to cling to the truth and charity in a world gone mad. A world where virtually no one even knows what truth and charity are. A world in which so many of our friends and neighbors have their own truth and live their own lives as if there is no God. A world in which even the priests and the bishops deny the moral laws of God. In which even the priests and bishops blatantly deny the justice of God. Blatantly deny that anybody goes to limbo. Blatantly deny that anybody goes to purgatory. Blatantly deny that anybody goes to hell. Do we know better than God? Is God's justice not just? Are we not called to trust God completely and trust that he knows what he's doing? The people in Noah's day did not trust and look what happened to them. Lot's wife did not trust, and look what happened to her. Now we see even the priests and religious mocking Fatima, ignoring Fatima, indifferent to Fatima. Our Lady did a miracle. They don't believe in something that's actually historical and backed by so many tens of thousands of witnesses. Are we paying attention to the signs that are so evident and plain? Are we like men without eyes to see or minds to think? Are we paying any attention to the warnings that God has sent us? Repent. Believe. Consecrate yourself to Our Lady. Live the message of Fatima and stay very, very close to Our Lady. Very close. Time is running out. It's running out.